members of the committee. Uh, I'm Bob Marvini, state geologist in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. So uh, the clerk has handed out uh, a number of materials that I'm going to use. I'm not doing PowerPoint. I'm giving you paper that you can scribble on and it's take notes. To turn these lights out too, right after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, you did pretty well. Though. So uh, the, the the first one looks like this, and it just says overview of metallic mineral deposits and mining. So I'm going to talk about what we know about metallic mineral deposits in Maine and then give you an overview on how mining actually happens, what the components are of a mine, what some of the issues are with mining. And uh, that that's and I'll, I'm just going to touch briefly on current and past mining as well. So uh, Metallic mineral deposits, you can look at this map. There's a nice map that you're getting right now with all the colors on it. And um, this shows, this map shows uh, many, well, it shows what we have in a database for information on mineral deposits. It's not every mineral deposit that's out there. There's probably things that are on some geologic maps that didn't end up in a database, et cetera. But this, this characterizes the, um, uh, the distribution of, of mineral deposits fairly well. Um, the colors on the map, the colored bands represent different uh, bedrock units. So we're talking about mining uh, mineral deposits in bedrock. Uh, two, two key areas with the greatest mineral potential are two volcanic belts, and the first is in northern Maine. It's kind of the brown and yellow uh, colors on the map in northern Maine running from northeast to southwest. That's the general uh, trend of the geology in Maine. And uh, that has the Bald Mountain and other deposits in it. And the second one is the, the brown colors along the coast. That's what we call the coastal volcanic belt. And there are some uh, significant mineral deposits there. So two primary volcanic rock belts. The, the, the major deposits that we know of are, are associated with those uh, uh, significant volcanic rock belts, although there are others like Catawan Iron Works that's uh, related to intrusion. So all the pink on here are granites and those kinds of intrusive rocks that can have quite a bit of mineralization around them. You can you see that's the situation down uh, in the, the uh, Blue Hill area where Second Pond and the, and the Harborside mines were. So on this map, I've, and, and I've given you on the back information on some of the significant deposits. So Alder Pond, Bald Mountain, Katahdin Iron Works, et cetera. <clears throat> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the, the uh, details of this, but the one key thing to understand about a map like this is it's not a map of future mines because most of these deposits, will, will, nobody's going to look at them again because they're so small. It's just not worth, you know, doing anything in terms of potential economic development. Those uh, large, uh, significant deposits, the ones shown in yellow stars on the map, and that are uh, explained a little bit on the back. Those are, those are significant deposits that could potentially be mined at some time, but I would say that none of them have been characterized to the degree necessary to know whether they could really be mined economically. A lot of work has been done at some, uh, a little work at others, but, but to really understand whether, uh, whether or not these could be mined economically would require a lot more, a lot more work, a lot more understanding of how um, the mining activity would meet environmental requirements as well. Um, there are two, so down on the coast, Second Pond and Harbor Side, those are the only uh, large-scale mines that we've had in the state in the last 50 years. And they, they were uh, active back in the 60s and 70s and are, are, uh, have environmental problems associated with them now. Bob, do you know when those were, those mines were actually started? Um, <clears throat> Harborside was in 1968. Went. Uh, I, I have a. Cal Callahan. So I have another handout that looks like this. 
that talks about current, and might as well go to that right now and I can get back to some of these other things. Uh, current activity and past mining. Well, current activity is easy. There isn't any. There's no, there's no metallic mineral mining going on in the state right now. Uh, there's quarrying, you know, for granite and uh, granite for dimension stone, for crushed rock aggregate. There's some so-called mining for gemstones in western Maine, but that's more like quarrying. It's busting up rock and, and hand-picking out uh, gemstones. So there's nothing that uh, qualifies as, as metallic mineral mining right now. Uh, so the former Callahan mine, that was active in, uh, I think the, the dates were 1968 to 1972. And uh, um, it was an open pit mine on the coast. They actually drained out Goose Pond there to uh, have access to the ore, uh, put in an open pit. Uh, in, my, in, in my other presentation, I've got some pictures, but it was about 360, 400 feet deep, 500 feet across, and they mined about 800,000 tons of... Uh, they actually did watered an estuary in order to get into it. Yes, right, that so-called Goose Pond, right. And now it's, it's flooded back and uh, there's a waste pile that is presenting some problems and tailings that are presenting some problems. And then the other is, on page three, is the uh, Kerr American Mine or Second Pond Mine, and that was an underground mine. And there are tailings left on that site that have been, had to be remediated and so forth, and there's continuing work going on there. I really didn't want to focus a whole lot on past history other than to say that they, they're all what we call legacy mines. They were active before there was very much at all in terms of environmental regulations focused on mining. Uh, Callahan Mine was before we had a Clean Water Act. I think both of them were before we had an uh, EPA. So there were, there were very few, uh, very few uh, regulations specific to mining. And so as a consequence, you know, neither of those mines had any uh, uh, baseline monitoring before activities began. So what, what were the conditions before mining? It's hard to say. Actually, uh, both those areas were uh, historic areas for small mining operations. The Douglas Mine and, and others right in the Blue Hill area were, you know, mined over 100 years ago because, of, you know, they were near the surface and copper. <coughs> copper and other metals were important com commodities. So. Uh, but those are what we call legacy mines, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Uh, most of these large deposits, the ones in the, the uh, shown in the large yellow uh, stars, are sulfide deposits, and um, and most of them are base metals, so copper, lead, zinc, um, those those types of basic metals. But most of them have some associated gold and silver. As well, but they, they're for the most part they're they're, um, they're sulfides except for um, the maple hovey deposit up in northern Maine, up in Arista County, which is an iron and manganese oxide deposit in slate beds. There, we share a lot of geology in common with uh, New Brunswick. That shouldn't be too surprising. Um, and as you, I'm sure you're aware, New Brunswick has had a pretty active mining uh, just, economy for a long time. Um, question. Yes. Question. Yes. Break. Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, anytime, please. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, New Brunswick, you, does New Brunswick have more what you call modern mines? Well, they have a mix, and I will touch on that in my. Uh, overview okay. in, in a few minutes. Thank you. But uh, so the geology continues into New Brunswick. They have a, a lot of mines. They've had a very active mineral exploration program because um, the uh, mineral deposits are owned by the Crown, and so uh, they lease lease deposits for mines. The uh, province and the and the, the nation get revenues that, that they roll back into exploration. We've we've had none of that in Maine. Our last our last real exploration program was in the 60s and 70s, and there's been a few small efforts since then, but no comprehensive program. If there was a comprehensive program, there would probably be a lot more dots and stars on this map than what we see here. So there's a, a lot more potential there. 
Um, let me turn back to this. You can follow along on, on this primary uh, uh, document here. I want to talk a little bit about sulfide minerals because they're the, they're the biggest issue when we're talking about mining in Maine, metallic mineral mines, uh, sulfide minerals. They're just compounds of copper, lead, or zinc, or iron with, with sulfur. And the problem is you, to extract the valuable minerals, they have to be ground up very fine. This increases the surface area exponentially. It's really an enormous increase in surface area, which allows uh, uh, much more interaction with the atmosphere. So the take, I have a chemical formula there. Well, Andy helped set up uh, detailed uh, geology here. So the chemical formula shows pyrite, FES2, pretty simple. But you add oxygen and, and water to that and end up releasing iron uh, ions and creating sulfuric acid. So just combining that mineral with the atmosphere can, can result in uh, sulfuric acid. When, and that lowers the pH. When that happens, a lot of other metals can go into solution as well, like arsenic and other things that are common. You know, arsenic is, is found just about everywhere we've looked in the state. Bald Mountain has a pretty high level of arsenic based on um, analyses that have been done to date. So that's, that's a big problem. Uh, so, and, and all of these deposits have pretty significant amounts of pyrite, and, and basically that's not a valuable mineral because there are other much more economical sources of iron, so pyrite ends up as a waste material that has to be dealt with. I already talked about current and past mining, so we'll turn to the, to the next page. What I want to turn Excuse to you now. Me, I, yes, please. Yes. And, and questions to the committee. questions like, as we don't, go. Don't please. look to me to uh, recognize because okay. I'm listening. Yes. And this is not a, it's a, it's an information session, so you guys take advantage of the experts. Go for it. Just trying to be polite. You're a nerd man. Thank you. And I appreciate that. <laughs> I'd like to address a, a something that was counterintuitive to me. Okay. Uh, one of the reports um, indicated that if the sulfides are underwater, it's uh, less dangerous than if it's left exposed to the air. And I, I was under the misimpression uh, that if uh, the exposure was to the to water, that that would lead to the sulfuric acid. Well, um, so could you, what's the difference? I mean, one of the one of the remedial things was to put it underwater. And right. I thought, well, wait a second, right. that's exactly the opposite of what we should do. So I was kind of mixed up. The, the key, yeah, one of the key factors is to isolate it from oxygen, and that's what a water cover is intended to do. Sure, there's some dissolved uh, oxygen in, in water. We all know that. That's how fish live in, in lakes. But if, uh, if a, uh, it's far less than, than what's in the atmosphere, and so a water cover is used in a number of sites as a way to isolate those wastes, pyrite and other waste sulfide minerals from oxygen. So even though it's sitting there um, in, in water, uh, it's, the oxygen will be in that, in that cover, in the water in the cover. It's hard for the oxygen, that oxygen will get used up that's in contact with the sulfide minerals. It's hard to replace it if you control it such that there's no real circulation of that water through the, the so-called tailings that are left behind. The worst situation would be if it was exposed to the air, it got rained on, got wet, right. then dried yeah. out, and then that oxygen would combine with the right. sulfide, yeah. creating the acid. So in a dry and dry environment, dry part of the country, it may not be as much of a problem dealing with these these uh, waste materials because the, the lack of water. But um, so the intent of that water covers to try to isolate it from oxygen. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to spend uh, probably the remainder of the time just uh, talking about the components of a metallic mineral mine. I know there's a lot of people on this committee who, who weren't here the last time this was taken up and may not uh, know the components of a mine. Um, so on page two, I, I picked an aerial view of the Red Dog Mine only for the sole purpose that in this aerial view you can see all the components of the mine. It has nothing to do with a, a, a view as to whether that's a good or bad mine. It just has everything 
right in that one picture. So if everybody's looking at page two. Um, so right in the middle, that big pond, that big green thing is the tailings pond. And that's where, um, where uh, material that is run through the mill ends up. Uh, that's, that's a waste to pause. I probably ought to go through this in order. Um, starting right at the mineral extraction site. So the first thing you need at a mine, first thing you'll have is a mineral extraction site. It's either an open pit or an underground mine. And in this case, there are open pit mines. If you look at the kind of lower right part, it says main pit. There's a, there's a pit there and there's a couple other Alaskan Eskimo names that are other pits in that same area. So this is a this is a an open pit mine. Uh, yes. There may not be a pit at all, and I'll show you a picture of a mine that has no pit. Um, the second component here, right in the middle, just below the tailings storage facility, tailings pond, is a waste stockpile. <coughs> To get at the ore in an open pit mine, a lot of a lot of non-economical rock has to be moved to be able to make this cone-shaped <coughs> excavation that accesses the uh, the ore. And that's <coughs> in this case that's stored on a on a waste stock uh, stockpile site. <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice is uh, running a little bit out on me now. It's just. It's just what happens. Um, so the main pit where the ore is coming out, waste rock is set aside. The ore is taken to the concentrator. That's on the, the right side of that tailings impoundment. That's a building. It's a mill. It's where the rocks are crushed and the minerals are separated. <clears throat> the minerals of interest are hauled away in this case to uh, a different locality. I think they're shipped overseas for smelting. and. Uh, the waste, the waste that the, the material that is of not of value that ends up going through the mill just to be able to separate the ore rock gets stored in this uh, tailings pond, and this would be an example of one that I believe is using a water cap to isolate the tailings from the atmosphere. So those are the basic components: an extraction site, whether it's open pit or underground, a waste rock pile. Uh, even even an underground mine can generate waste rock, and they they all do. Um, a mill that grinds the the minerals and and extracts the minerals of interest, and then a tailings pond or facility that um, deals with the waste material from the milling process. Um, this case, there's also um, not shown on here. There's a water treatment plant. Uh, right near the concentrator, I thought it was identified on there. But flipping to uh, the next page, I just wanted to give an, a couple examples of open pit, uh, what an open pit mine looks like. Uh, there's the Callahan mine in 1972. Again, the, that estuary was dewatered. They put a dam in at one end and pumped it out and diverted surface water to keep this open, about 500 feet across. 800,000 tons came out of that. I wanted to con contrast that with the next picture. The next picture just shows how blasting and the big trucks and, and those kinds of things that happen in a, in a large mine. That, but these are images from the Bingham Canyon mine. That is the single largest man-made excavation on Earth, uh, two and a half miles across, uh, over 3,000 feet deep. And the deposit, 800, over 800 million tons of ore at that site. So it's a thousand times the, the the ore deposit itself is a thousand times more than what we uh, what was mined out of the Callahan mine. That's still offering? Yes. Callahan was copper, mostly well copper and zinc, and the. the uh, Bingham Canyon is a copper mine. So, um, so those are those are. I just wanted to compare and contrast. Uh, you know what Callahan looked like with what a, a really large mine looks like today. 
I don't have uh, on the next page. I, I just briefly mentioned underground workings. I don't have any, a picture. It's just it's just tunnels underground where the the mine uh, the minerals are extracted with large vehicles underground um, and with fewer openings. The mine ends up with less waste rock because the, the, you can drive right into the ore. You can build tunnels right into the ore, and you don't have to. The waste rock can be used to maintain the integrity of the tunnels and, and so forth. So there's a lot less waste rock that comes out. So those are the two types of mines, open pit, underground. The next part is about ore concentrating. It starts with these large crushers, uh, the, the mill, so that picture of the uh, Red Dog mine with the mill, the buildings have these large ball mills in them. They're just big rotating drums, put the ore in, uh, it gets crushed to successively smaller scale <clears throat> and then finally the the objective is to get the grain size down such that each individual grain is one mineral it's not a composite of several minerals <clears throat> and in a lot of cases that's got to be ground to a pretty fine powder or at least fine sand size it's very fine water's added in this process to go to the next step so this is the real uh, noisy part of a mine if you've ever been to one you can't walk in there without uh, ear, ear protection I'm sorry well uh, most of the time when you, when uh, the ore is is put into the uh, into the ore that's delivered to the mill is really just those metallic minerals it's not any of the so-called host rock you want to try to avoid throwing too much of the in, in the case of a main deposit, the volcanic rocks themselves into the mill because you won't get much out of them. So try to, you know, be, and, and the, so there's a very careful process in both an open pit mine and a um, underground mine in what they call grade control, making sure that they are only putting through the mill the highest grade material and not putting barren waste rock through the, through well that's the purpose of grinding it separates them into uh, single mineral grains and then there's another process to separate all those and that and that's the next part um, most uh, a lot of mines they use a, a couple different processes but most likely is this flotation cell approach where um, the material the so-called pulp from the, the mills are introduced into this big tub that has an agitator in it and air is injected and it's stirred up. Other chemicals are added, a lot of chemicals that, you know, that have to be dealt with in terms of the environment later on. But the objective is that the, the minerals of interest actually adhere to the bubbles and float to the top. It's grind, ground very fine so it'll actually adhere to bubbles and float. The material you, of, that's not of interest goes to the bottom and is pumped out and those are the tailings the so-called tailings the stuff that is not of interest and a lot of it in in many cases in probably just about any of these deposits in Maine would be pyrite and other similar similar iron oxide minerals that just don't have value um, the other approach is to um, is to leach the minerals out with chemicals and and that might be done in a controlled vat environment as well and that's often done at gold mines some in, <coughs> some in Alaska that I've visited um, the gold ore is put into large vats and cyanide is used and that's what leaches out the the gold and then and then the gold is extracted from the cyanide and there's a whole loop system to reuse as much as possible but then there are issues with dealing with you know waste uh, uh, fluids when when the mining is done so that's the other approach and uh, um, I uh, heap leaching would be something that would be uh, at least the, the draft rules would prohibit that whereas vat leaching in a closed environment would be a permitted approach um, I'm going to turn now to waste rock. Are there any questions on this part? Okay. So mine waste. There are two types of mine waste. The first is the barren rock that gets moved to 
just to provide access to the coal, uh, to the ore material. Even in an underground mine, to just start to drive in, often the, the, the operation has to go through barren rock. And it's so-called barren, it, it might not be really barren. It just doesn't have enough uh, minerals of interest to be worth putting through the mill. And so they can still have a significant component of sulfide minerals in them. Um, the surface area is increased a little bit by that, not as much as by the milling process, um, but it's, uh, it's increased and, and so there's more exposure to the atmosphere bringing it out of the mine, exposes it to the atmosphere. So there are issues, uh, there are issues with that. Um, so um, on, the, on the page six, there's a picture of some pretty uh, coarse waste from the Restigouche mine in New Brunswick. Uh, that mine's closed, but this was dealing with uh, their waste rock pile, and um, some of this waste can, can produce enough acid to be uh, a problem. And, and the original plan for this mine was to put all the acid generating waste rock back into the open pit when they were done. Um, unfortunately, what happened was uh, they didn't control that process very well, and then they ended up with a lot more um, rock identified as acid generating and mixed in than, than, than would have been if they'd really controlled and tested the waste rock coming out and segregated it appropriately. So they ended up with more waste and, and once it's all jumbled together, you know, it's, you, you can't really separate it back out. So they have a problem with too much, <clears throat> too much volume to go back into the hole. So that's one category of waste is dealing with the waste rock. The second and the largest uh, uh, category of waste is the tailings. And they're the biggest environmental concern at any of these mine sites, particularly when it's sulfide minerals. Uh, due, and due to the ore grade, there's just an enormous volume. Even the good ore rock that gets put through the mill has a, a very large volume of, of waste with it. So. I have a note here that the current grade of, a, of copper being mined in the world today is around 1%. So that's the ore, 1% copper. Goes into the mill. 99% of what goes into the mill then goes out as tailings. So an interesting, just an, that's just an interesting fact. So any, any of our cars, a regular car has about 45 pounds of copper in it. So there's about 4,500 minus 45 pounds of waste somewhere in the world tied to every car out in the parking lot there and for a for a, a, a hybrid car there's twice as much copper so the, the numbers go up so that's just that's just a reality the, the grades are the grades are low I'm sorry you said hybrid has double the amount yes the hybrid car has about 90 pounds of copper in the motors the, the electric motors oh, the electric motor yeah. causes yeah. that problem yeah, yeah. I got you Wondering about the pl they yeah, put it it's in the, the electric motors. That I figure they probably put yeah. the plastic as well on the outside. <laughs> it also has a bunch of uh, rare earth parts in it. That yeah, well, that too. We won't get into that discussion, but, yeah. but you make a very good point. Your, yes. Your 1% was of the stuff that goes into the mill. That's does the that stuff include that the goes, waste as no, well? No, that does not. So if you include the waste, what yeah. are you talking about? Oh, a tenth it's, of a percent? Yeah, it's small. Right. So, but, you know, a lot less effort. The waste rock is moved and put aside. You're not putting a lot of effort into it other than to, to put it aside. And then when it heads to the mill, that's when you get your 1%. That's right. Okay. So, as I mentioned, it's finally crushed, and that increases the uh, surface area tremendously. Page 7 is a picture of a, an aerial view of the Brunswick Number no. 12 mine. Uh, in New Brunswick, and showing there uh, the enormous tailings basin, that uh, tailings impoundment at that site. Uh, remember, this was open. It's an underground mine. It was the largest underground zinc mine in the world when it was operating. Um, but it began in 1964. Again, you know, be really ahead of real environmental focus on these these areas. Interestingly. This mine has no waste rock pile because everything that they took out of the mine went through the mill, all of it. 
Um, as a consequence, there's 100 million tons of material in that waste rock pile. I think it's 6,500 feet from the south end to the north end across there. Uh, I took the LUPC there uh, in September of 2013 and we walked right on the surface. It's all very fine pyrite. And so there's an enormous runoff issue illustrated by those ponds on the right side and they have to have a water treatment plant. That plant is basically going to run in perpetuity because there's the ore that rich that they took everything and ground it up or is it just that that's well it was it was I, I don't remember the grade I think it was around uh, seven or eight maybe higher percentage but they they, they controlled the, the underground mining such that they really they just decided that you know it would just be easier to just run everything through the mill than to try and separate it but it was pretty high grade they uh, when I went there the the manager of the of, of the the waste facility now said it's actually that tailings impoundment is 1% copper, 1% zinc. So in the future, that, that could actually be mined and, and take that 1% out. So, so there's 100, but there's 100 million tons there. So that's a, an enormous, uh, enormous, uh, more enormous issue. Um, as we know, uh, uh, these tailings um, impoundments facilities are, you know, they're the they're one of the biggest issues. There have been some very high profile failures of these uh, facilities in, in the last year um, that in that just uh, underscore the need to ensure that these are built properly and that they're uh, monitored and you know the corners are not cut on dealing with this. This is the longest term waste issue <coughs> at any one of these sites. There are, um, you know, again, Callahan, Second Pond, um, Brunswick Number 12 were all before we had environmental regulations. There's a lot of things that might be done now to address these concerns from tailings. I list them. I list some. This is not a comprehensive list. It's just things that would be considered putting underlinings on, doing a dry storage and capping it, doing a permanent water cover. This is dry. This will be a dry cover on this when they're done. There's also backfilling. Some mines now take the tailings, make it into a paste, and backfill the mine, usually an underground mine, with that to try and reduce the exposure to the atmosphere. Um, so that's kind of the overview of components of, of a mine site. I just wanted now to turn a little bit towards legacy versus modern mines. Again, I've talked about this already, but um, and the, a chart on page eight, a table, shows some of the differences between a legacy mine and a modern mine. So Callahan Mine and, and Second Pond Mines had no baseline monitoring. There was no requirement to do it. Nobody did it. And so knowing what the pre-existing conditions were, you can't do it now. And modern mines would, every modern regulation would require baseline monitoring for some period of time for a number of things. The legacy mines, they really didn't think about reclamation. They took the tailings and just dumped them out and said, well, we'll deal with that if we, I don't even think they, they may not have even thought about dealing with them later on. Now that's a requirement. You have to think about that up front. You have to test it. Um, waste rock is unsegregated at, at a lot of these older mines, and it would be segregated now, um, and I have some examples that I'll go through in, in a minute. The acid, gener uh, acid generating waste rock was used for construction on the mine site. That happened in a lot of those New Brunswick mines. They basically spread the environmental problem over the entire mine site because they were just using so-called barren waste rock to build roads and structures and, you know, it just spread the, the problem around. So segregating the waste rock would be uh, the thing to do now. Uh, the waste rock was untreated, just dumped. There are ways that it could be interlayered with buffering materials to address some of the acid generating. Uh, tailings, pond, the tailings impoundments, dams built from tailings. The bottom two pictures are from Brunswick number 12 from on top of that tailings uh, impoundment. The one on the left looks down the slope, and you can see how eroded it is. It's just built of tailings. That's mostly just pyrite, and that's just eroding and going into the drainage systems. 
and on the right, they, their remediation is to armor it. So they were working on a multi-year program to armor that entire um, uh, structure. So uh, a modern mine would not be, the, the, the tailings dam would not be built from tailings. Just not the right thing to do. Um, and then um, on page nine, the last page, uh, examples from the half mile mine in New Brunswick. That one was opened in 2012. It's not, it's not a, a full mine, and by full mine I mean it doesn't have all the components of a mine that I just described. This has an underground extraction site, so it's an underground mine uh, where uh, sulfide minerals, fairly high grade uh, sulfide mineral, minerals were um, mined out, um, but the ore was hauled over to Brunswick Number 12 Mill for milling. So they don't have a mill site here. They don't have tailings. The tailings from 2000. This mine is not operating right now as they look for. Uh, they are looking at other mine sites to uh, restart mills that are shuttered right now to continue mining here. You, but you said this one opened in 2012. 2012. It's, not now. it's well. They opened it in 2012 to test their process of. Uh, extracting the ore and doing the metallurgy on the uh, milling process, you know, testing the whole milling process, which they did at Brunswick number 12. But now that there's no mill readily available for milling this, they it's shut down and they're doing other characterization work. The second picture on the right shows their waste rock um, pad where they set aside the acid generating waste rock. Every thousand tons of material that comes out of the hole, they test it. If it's acid generating, they put it on this special pad. It'll go back down into the mine to backfill as they progress in mining. And that the rest is set aside and will be capped um, as non-acid generating, um, uh, non generating rock. A thousand tons sounds like a lot. A thousand tons of this kind of rock would almost fit in this room. So it, in volume wise, it's, it's actually a pretty small volume. They're testing. This is a pretty rigorous testing program. Then finally, a little bit on you know, open pit versus underground mining. Um, I think uh, it's the interplay of a whole number of factors here that I've outlined that determine whether or not a, a mine would be operated as an open pit or as an underground mine. Certainly, uh, depth is a factor. Shallow uh, lending itself to open pit, but not necessarily. And deep, almost requiring that it be an underground mine. The attitude, whether it's bowl shape, the geometry of bowl shape, or a slab, a slab would more likely be um, mined as an underground mine. Um, a bowl shape could be more amenable to uh, surface mine. Um, gentle versus steep. Uh, low grade is often an open pit mine. That's with the Bingham Canyon is about 1% copper. So uh, it's an enormous open pit mine. Um, higher grade can uh, really um, help facilitate underground mining because you can get to really high grade rock without moving a lot of volume. Waste volume, there's a lot more waste in an open pit mine than uh, an underground mine. So managing, dealing with the volume of waste is a factor when deciding. It's not just, it's how, how you can manage it. Do you have, you know, uh, geography on the landscape that can deal with the volume of waste from an open pit? And then how do you, if it's acid generating, is that going to be the best approach to deal with the environmental regulations? Maybe better to go underground and minimize the waste if, it, if the, a large volume of waste rock is going to generate acid. Um, and then, of course, production costs are a lot lower on an open pit mine than, in, than an underground mine. Um, so all those factors um, have to be sorted together to try and determine whether uh, a mine might be developed one way or the other. So I, that's basically my overview. I'd be happy to respond to any other questions. Thank you. What are the circumstances under which you'd really have to treat in perpetuity? And would it be something that yeah, develops so, over yeah, time, or do you go into it planning to do it that way? 
that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. You know, uh, I think I think a, a general consensus by everybody is that we don't want to see a mine in Maine where there has to be a water treatment plant that just runs forever. Um, and so, you know, how do you how do you determine that is is kind of the question. It would be great to be able to point to some mine somewhere in the world and say, well, here's an example of one where, you know, a mine was operated, had a water treatment plant after it closed that ran for X number of years, got shut down, and there's there's no issue. I haven't found one. I just have not found one that um, meets meets those requirements. There's a number of mines that have been talked about um, in, in this process over the years. Um, one is the... Uh, the Flambeau mine in Wisconsin it was an open pit mine, but again, it was really only half a mine because they didn't mill there. They uh, took the, took the ore, I think, to Canada to mill at, at a, a mill that was already in place there. Um, so, but they backfilled the pit with with um, the waste rock, segregated the waste rock, put it back in the hole, and yeah, there are some lingering problems there, but I think it's a pretty small problem compared to. Um, what a, what a, uh, other types of mines compared to Brunswick Number 12, which just has an enormous problem. Um, another mine is the Eagle Mine in Michigan that uh, you know has been talked about. Unfortunately, that only just started operation, but the projection is that five years after they're done with with mining, they can shut down their water treatment plant. But again, that's the water treatment plant that's just dealing with the mine site. The, the ore is being shipped to the Humboldt Mill. To, for milling, the tailings are going into an old open pit there, and I don't know what the what the plans are for, you know, water treatment there. So there aren't, you know, we just can't point to something and say, well, here's a really good example. So, yeah, that, that's my mouth. yes, interrupt is very important because it was used quite a bit. And the fact is yes. that it goes to an old iron mine. That's right. And it's taken care of there, so it's not really a fair comparison. Right. That's right. Um, and, and that's an underground mine, and so they're minimizing their waste rock. They're putting the waste rock back down in the hole, but the tailings are going to end up over at this other site in a, in a former iron ore open pit. Um, so, uh, but, it's, well, I'm still talking about uh, the, the, so, you know, where do you get, it's, it's, so we're left with then trying to project, you know, based on the materials, based on climate, based on volumes. Um, trying to project what the outcome will be at a mine site um, in the long term in terms of needing water treatment. And that involves, you know, you have to model. Um, models are, are good. You know, you heard about groundwater flow modeling. It's a similar kind of modeling. There are a lot of assumptions that go into models. There are a lot of uncertainties on each parameter used in a model. So, you know, a model can guide you, but it Will it give you the the absolute answer on how long it will take? Um, the answer is no. I mean, you can do some testing, testing in a laboratory, testing in a in, in an environment that tries to um, replicate the climate, but it's still very difficult to, to come up with with a, with an answer. I would say, you know, well, I'll just throw it out there. The whole discussion last time was about should it be 10 years, should it be 30 years, right? The uh, the current rules, the 1991 rules, actually have a 30-year closure period for treating uh, for a treating system. That was in the proposed rules. Which which one of those 10 or 30 is right? I don't know. It's it's um, it's it's a real problem. It there there needs to be a number because I think after a certain point. The answer is you don't really know, right? After a number of years, so you have to pick a number. I don't know what the right number is. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you come up with some kind of confidence level? Uh, well, I think, what, I think that's what I think that's what the modeling <laughs> yeah. attempts to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. To to come up with you know, given all the uncertainties of parameters that go in and assumptions, you can come up with a a standard deviation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, in the, you mentioned some mines where they do the extraction, but they do the milling or processing 
off-site right. at a different right. mine. Mm -hmm. So um, does that mean that it's, I would imagine that means it's more cost-effective for the mining company to do that. It's more cost-effective than building another mill on the site. That's right. On the yeah, site. If, there's a, if there's a mill that could be used. And, and in a lot of cases, what happens is, like at Brunswick Number 12, that's exactly what was going on. It had its own deposit on site, but there were other satellite deposits yeah. that could then be mined and or trucked to and the how, existing mill. Do you have any idea how far those other sites were that were going to get processed? It, they were tens of miles. Tens basically. of miles. Yeah. And do you know where the closest um, mill is to the state of Maine or to any of these big deposit area. Yeah, they're they're a, a longer way. They're probably, you know, in Quebec there's a mill. There's the people that are looking at the Alder Pond deposit have talked about shipping the ore to Quebec to a mill in, in Quebec. That's that's I, I don't know, that's probably by road probably more than 50 miles. Um, uh, Eastern Maine potentially those could go to a, if if there was a large enough deposit and, and high enough grade that the trucking could be factored into the, the process, then potentially some sites in New Brunswick. It's more likely that any of these deposits uh, would probably have a mill on site. Okay, thanks. What is the uh, proper terminology for the uh, pond? It gets left at the end of yeah. cover. The is it yeah. called a lagoon or a? Well, they call them tailings ponds. They call them tailing storage facilities, um, tailings impoundments. Uh, all those all those terms get used. I think I think the industry likes to talk about tailing storage facility. It sounds uh, sounds benign. <laughs> and if you have a lot of sulfate refuse there, yeah. what uh, what is that water like? Well, um, you know, this is the discussion back to the discussion about, um, you know, at how, you, would, how you wouldn't you, want to go you, swim in there, right? You mean if you had a tailings pond with the water? Yeah, there there would be there would be uh, uh, sulfate and and minerals and metals in that capping water, and many of these have a water treatment plant that deals with just the water on top. Um, and um, um, I don't know whether the, it gets to a point where that can be shut off. I'm not sure. And how do you stop the water from seeping down into the ground? How do you seal the bottom? Yeah, well, um, uh, liners are used um, under some of these uh, facilities. It could be uh, synthetic or natural clay materials that are used as liners, similar to what gets done at a solid waste site. So the, the wet, the wet um, cover is just one approach. I mean, others are to uh, cap it, actually to dry it as much as possible. This is being done at one mine in Alaska. Dry it so it's actually stackable. Build a, you know, you can build a mound out of it, out of these tailings, and then cover it with a liner and cover it with soil to isolate it from, from water and, and air. So I'm just curious um, if, and I don't know if you're the right person to ask or not, but I'd love to see a mill that, I mean a mill, a mine that was opened in the 2000s um, and is either still operating or closed that, that actually operated. I know this sort of did, but, or just point right. me in that direction. Well, no, I mean, that's the problem. You can't, if you want... Um, I can't point to a mine that has been um, <clears throat> permitted under modern mining rules that then is mined out and closed. I mean, the closest thing is a flambeau mine in Wisconsin, but it's not, it doesn't have that tailings component. So I can't point to one that has a tailings component and say, you know, this mine operated for X number of years, it's been closed down for another Y number of years. And so. but, but even a mine that's still open? Well, um, you know, the Greens Creek mine in, in Alaska, that's the one that I talked about where they're actually dewatering the tailings and stacking them. That's an underground mine. Um, everyone has some kind of environmental problems, but
but while the mine is operating, there's actually a resource and, ins and a major incentive to address those environmental problems as the, you know, and that's, that's what typically happens in an operating mine. If they're found to be in violation, they, they address that immediately or they're shut down. And, and I was not, it wasn't really a loaded question. I was just yep. curious to see yep. um, if there is anything operating still. Yeah, Senate Representative Martin. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thinking about that reminds, really leads to the question in terms of you have arsenic coming out of Ball Mountain. Uh, we're not treating it. Right. And so uh, it's existing. Right. And it eva eventually dissipates. Well, that's you know that 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 question is is part of what's addressed with the baseline monitoring, and there's been you know there hasn't been there's been some monitoring done there in in the previous rounds of trying to um, permit a mine at that site. Um, I know that some of the boreholes, the water in those, have 600 parts per billion right. arsenic, yeah. and the drinking water standard is 10. And it flows on the ground and, and it eventually flows, goes and into the body some of the, waters, some of and the then at yeah. that point, right, the, it gets to be zero. Right. Some of the streams have 30 parts per billion. So yep. there must be some analysis that can be determined as to the vol. We know what the volume is now right. in some of those right. pit holes. Yeah. And we know that it's some of that is flowing on the ground and has yep. been yep. since day one that the earth arrived. And, and so it's not being treated. And then over time, it dissipates to where Well, it dilutes. It dilutes. Oh, oh, right, and that's my point. I think, the water. I think there's got to be uh, some analysis well, that, that analysis, tells us how, how long that's going to go and or how far it's going to go before it gets to be zero. Yeah, that, that analysis needs to be done. And, and the, biggest, <clears throat> the biggest problem, uh, Representative Martin, will be dealing with if, if this mine site were to be developed and, and, and minerals to be milled on site, then the, um, the uh, acid generating capacity of those minerals is pretty high. And as the pH is lowered, more and more of that arsenic is going to be released into well, the water. Well, that's suggesting we give them credit for <laughs> what was already there. No, that's but right. The point is, yes. the, the point is, at some point, whatever there is, is going to dissipate if, depending on the area that you've got to deal with. Right. I, the, again, though, the, because the the milling process will greatly, enormously expand the I surface think, volume. I, I think much more arsenic yeah. is going to be released. I think so, and, and I don't know what you know. I don't know what the answer is for well, dealing I, I with that. I don't either, but I know what's going on now. Yeah. Well, that's right. No, naturally, the process is happening, and it's being diluted by all the surface water. So by the time you get over to Fish River Lake, I, I, I think it might be a few parts per billion arsenic, it, and it could be, could be coming from At any least, number of sources right. by the time you get there. Right. Well, it's also, I mean, we have, I have a community uh, that I represent, half of the community is drinking water with its private wells. Right. Uh, yeah. The sulfur amount in that water is so high that they need equipment to yeah. drink the water that that's comes right. out of the ground yeah. uh, and spend two, three thousand dollars literally for the equipment and then another 500 a year to, to put carbon filters through it. Yeah. So, you know, I yes. think that we sort of forget that there's no, there's nothing in the environment around us, but it's everywhere. It um, is, that's right. We found arsenic almost everywhere we've looked in the state. Right, right. Senator Brain. Thank you. Just a quick question back to um, Representative Harlow's question. I, and I didn't hear the question completely. Was your was your question just in the United States, or was it also in New Brunswick? Because it sounds like New Brunswick has some similar geology, and I wonder if there are some 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 in New Brunswick that we could well, look to. Well, yeah, New Brunswick does have similar geology. I was giving a very general answer on my knowledge of mines around the world. Um, you know, uh, and and I there just isn't one there because a lot of them, a lot of those mines were open before you know early. Uh, many decades ago, um, you know, that half mile mine is, it looks like it's going to be a very environmentally sound process, but they're not milling there. So we still have to look for a site that has a mill, you know, and tailings that is meeting these obligations without a permanent water treatment system. And I just don't know where to point for one of those. Thank you. I'm sure that those that are sitting in the audience will help us find some. Thank you. Uh, 
any other questions for Mr. Mark, Dr. Mark? Ah, Representative Thank you. Um, speaking of the earth arriving, um, <laughs> the Champlain um, <laughs> explored the coast and some of the rivers in 1607, and uh, just north of Bucksport, there's supposedly a fortification. Um, but in search of the Golden City, is there anything to Blue Hill uh, being the Golden City? <laughs> <laughs> no, that. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of mineralization around that area, but I don't think anybody's found the so-called Mother Lode or, you know, any. You know, there, there could be other deposits there. There just hasn't been a comprehensive exploration program to to discover those. There was in there? Yeah, well, there were a whole number of mines in, in that area. I don't remember all the details, but um, there are places where houses are now built on, you know, a former uh, underground, you know, the opening for underground mine, or it's right in their backyard. So, so from your perspective, was there anything that might appear that uh, it could have been? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Marmody, thank you, and I would assume that we can ask for your time during work session. I'm um, sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. For, thank you. Now we are going to move to um, Representative Foley. We're going to juggle the schedule a little bit because uh, 